I'm Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. Today, we have one of my favorite people on the planet, <laughs> a kind of cantankerous <laughs> artistic type from Brooklyn, New York. Yep. Now, by, from Coleraine. Yep. Tony Pacifico <laughs> Palumbo. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, how you doing? To me. I'm doing good. How, how you are doing? You? I'm how doing, you doing good. I'm doing good. So, I'm from Park Slope, Brooklyn. Okay, I have yeah. no idea. I just know nah. it's Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn. Park Slope. You still have the accent. You can't get rid of that. I can't get rid of it. No Have you matter. tried? No, I can't. I gave up trying. Okay, you know? so there was a time when you thought maybe you know you what? When I was an art director in advertising, people used to say, you know, you talk kind of funny. I said, yeah, but it's what I say that's more important. Okay. And no okay. matter how I say it. And one okay, thing but is, I can't get rid of this. You can't get rid of it. No, anybody born in Brooklyn talks peculiar. Now, Michael, <laughs> your husband, has yeah. a different accent. Uh, well, he has the Long Island accent. Oh, okay. It might be a little. He's from Cambria Heights. I was from Park Slope. Okay, but so I was in the heart of Brooklyn. So there's there's a dis difference between those two areas. Well, I don't think it changes the voice. Even in New Jersey, they sound like us. You think so? Oh yeah. Okay. I think that whole. <laughs> Did you ever hear the way the president sounds? I hate oh, to say it, painful. but he does sound like he's from Brooklyn. It's painful. In New York, and well, he was from Queens. Well, the thing let's is, not go into We that. don't need to go there. No, no, no. We're gonna, in fact, we're going to talk about beautiful things. <laughs> yes. We're going to talk about artwork in yes, your gallery. Yes, yes, yes. Because recently in the news, I, I saw that the Green Emporium, where you used to show your work, yeah. has changed hands. Yes. I don't know who bought it, but I hear somebody did. That was a lovely spot. I know. It was a great restaurant. Well, I used to show my artwork there, and, and that's used to why show I had there. it in my head for years. I'm tired of doing restaurants. I've given up on restaurants. I've had enough of that. So I finally decided to open up the house and as a gallery. And it was a cooperage, so we call it the barrel shop. It was called the Kelly Barrel Shop years ago. So I retained the name the Barrel Shop Gallery. Okay. But I'm featuring my paintings. And I'm also featuring my neon, my neon sculptures. Which, which actually, trade. you were into neon before anybody else. Well, in 1978, we opened up a gallery on Hudson Street in the village. Okay. In a tiny little store. It was a small, small place. And then we moved to the next block twice, bigger and bigger. And we had no workers working there as far as making the neon. I used to go and find people who could make my neon at the beginning. And then I went up to the Bronx one day and I found these brothers that were working down in the cellar. They were from uh, Colombia. One was named Yvonne and the other one was named Don Victor. And I asked them if they would come and do neon for me because they were working like in a sweatshop. But the thing is, the neon they were using was for your general advertising, you know, for bars and stuff. No, you know? unfortunately, when I knew nothing about neon when this started. Okay. When I was an art director, my campaign was the I Love New York campaign. And I was very happy. I was working with Milton Glaser. I worked at a, an ad agency called Wells Rich and Green. I was there for almost 20 years. And then Michael had decided he wanted to give me a, a present of the I Heart New York, and I had a cousin who worked at a big shop in Manhattan that made neon. And he went to him, and they surprised me with I Heart New York in neon. And I liked it. So Michael was working in the hospital. He was working in Long Island Jewish, and he was working in the laboratory where they did experiments on monkeys, Regis monkeys. They actually had a monkey in our house for a weekend with diapers on, swinging from the chandeliers. But anyway, he couldn't take it anymore. I was tired of The neon. monkey or Michael? <laughs> <laughs> no, he couldn't take the job. We liked the monkey. And, you know, and then we finally decided we got to change our lives. So uh, I just came up with this idea and I started drawing my own designs. And it was very funny because in 1978, the best-selling book was my competitor. There was, a, there was a place on West Broadway, and it was called Let There Be Neon. And he, his name was Rudy Stern, and which was funny. He used to come down to my gallery when we first opened and see what I was doing. And I said, well, Rudy, if you give me five bucks, I'll give you my catalog, you know? And we moved on and we did, you know, we went from one place to another place. It got bigger and bigger and it was really a lot of fun. And you were part of the whole disco era, that, that oh, famous yeah, well, palm tree or? Oh no, there was the Paradise Garage. The Paradise Garage, right. And now every year, you know, the Paradise Garage is no longer there. But they still have a... But they have a festival right. every summer. 
and we, they sell these T-shirts with my, I did the original logo right. of the man with the tambourine and the tattoo on him with the whistlers and the poppers. Uh, Michael Brody, who was the owner, and Larry Levan was the DJ. They came into my uh, gallery when I first opened about, we were only in business about a month. And they threw this sketch, uh, a rough sketch, on my table. And they said, I said, well, what is that? They said, well, that's our logo. We're opening up a, a disco about four blocks from here on Hudson Street. It was an old garage. And uh, they said to me, can you make this in neon and design the logo? I said, yeah. Uh, I said, when do you need it? They said, in a month. I said, a month? Well, anyway, I did it. It was a huge eight-foot round circle with the man with the tambourine and the tattoo. And uh, it was up a ramp. And we used to go there, and it, we got it installed for the opening night. And we would see people like Grace Jones. Mm -hmm. And it was really a lot of fun. And they would come and change the set every day and put new palm trees. There was no, there was no alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but they had something else going on. There was a lot of things going on. But anyway, they would come uh, from Studio 54. They would come down to Hudson Street and always see what Larry was doing. And it was a very popular place, and it was a lot of fun. It lasted about 10 years. Right. Then it closed, and then it became the gay men's uh, health crisis building. It's mm -hmm. still there. Right. But they retained this, this event every summer. They come from, uh, the English seem for the love of it. Why, I don't know. They, if you go to Fine Art America, you'll see the T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And these people all buy the T-shirt and they all dance. Do they you get do any discount. royalties on the T-shirt? No, I get two bucks. This is what's stupid. Okay. They make that all the money. Up. Yeah, but not, well, maybe they sell about 25 or 30 a year. But anyway, it's on Fine Art America. I finally put it on my website, which is Neon Artists. Right. And, uh, I sell a little bit of them. I'm working with Silver Design in uh, Greenfield. They're lovely people. Right. So, well, actually, you, you've had a, a lot of different uh, ventures or websites because you had your Grey Gardens or Italian well, yeah. Story. Well, this is part of my paintings. I don't know what, no, my Italian story is right now, the book is almost ready. In fact, I'll have it in about two weeks. I'm going to be selling it locally. The book? Boswell's, yeah. Oh, and, so you uh, had a book of, of your Well, of your it's, paintings? Being put, it's put, being put together. There's a blog right now right. called anitaliansstory.com. Right. And right now, there's about 45, 45 or 47 paintings on there. Mm -hmm. Basically, all of my family. Those, and you painted those off of old photographs? I was the collector of all the photographs. And there's the famous one, like, of a bocce mm -hmm. painting. Yeah, I remember that. And my father's in the back. And when my father passed, uh, I looked, I don't know, I had to clean out the house. And I found this photograph. I couldn't believe it was photographed in 1939. It was a long black and white photograph and of these men playing bocce. And they were dressed very elegant, were white, white berets and the women were doing gardening in the background and it was a great scene and my uncle was playing bocce and I painted it and uh, it's one of the paintings in the series uh, my mother's in it my brother's in it everybody in my family's in it and it was very funny and there's one that's very funny called the Gumada. Do you know what a gumada is? You're going to tell me, I hope. Uh, well, a gumada is... What's a gumada with you? No, it's not a gumada. <laughs> it's a painting I have when I was in the Army. Okay. Uh, the, I was, my, my job was to go to the World's Fair, and the Japanese pavilion was there. And I, I went to the fair, and I saw this Nikon. Well, this, is when, this is back in 1965. Okay. And the Nikon, no, 63, I'm sorry, 63, and, and the Japanese had brought the cameras over. And I said to the man, what are you going to do with these cameras when, when the show's over? They said, we're going to sell them. So I said, how much would you want for that Nikon? And he said, probably around 300. Wow, that was a lot of money back then. Yeah, but I wanted it so badly. So I bought the Nikon. And I'll never forget, I went home, my mother, I went into the kitchen, I bought a roll of film, and that time we used to have slides, ectochrome, right. codachrome. Mm -hmm. My mother was making lasagna in the kitchen, and I said, Ma, look at me, you know, and I photographed my mother preparing the lasagna. Then I go in the garden, and I see my uncle, 
and he was a real, I, this is one of the paintings, you have to see it in my series, it's called the Gomada. You know what the Gomada is? I have, you're gonna tell me. Well, the Gomada is the one that the gangster goes out with when his wife is home cooking. Oh. It's usually his girlfriend. Well, That's I didn't know what was going on. I just thought it was a great scene. Right. My uncle's there leaning up against the fence, really macho, you know. And this na our neighbor, she had curlers in her hair, and we had a fence that divided our two houses. We both had bronze stones. And she's pushing on the fence so hard. And I said, Jenny, Uncle Philly, let me take your picture. And I did. And I liked it so much that I ended up painting it. 30 years later, my first cousin, my uncle's daughter, says to me, that's the son of a, that my father cheated on my mother with. I said, oh, the good mother. You know, so that's the name of the painting. Her name was Jenny, and it's a great painting, and it's sort of like, it, you could see this flow of the lighting. It's sort of saying, like, come into my parlor, says the spider to the fly, mm. you know? But I didn't know the story. Right. But I got it. Well, you know, it didn't end well for the fly. No. No, but it, it ended all right for him. But okay. my aunt was so beautiful, I could never figure out why he ever went out with her anyway. She was a dog. Yeah, what's a Gamada with him? <laughs> there was a lot of Gamada. <laughs> <laughs> but so, anyway, that's the book. And then I'm going to do another book. It's, it's going to be My Life in Neon. Right. In 1978, no, 1980, the bestseller in New York was Let There Be Neon. And I'm, I have, I don't know how many slides of all my work. And I'm having someone help me put that book together now. And I think it would be a good selling book because a lot of the people that are in the neon business, mm -hmm. all the designs that, are in, that I did were my own. Right. And a lot of the people today, I look at, I look at the internet and I see what they say is neon art. Mm -hmm. Well, they need a little help, a lot of people. <laughs> so I think a lot of them would be interested in, like you want to draw a cowboy hat, you want to draw a boot, you want to do a lips. Mm -hmm. I did them all. So palm trees, flamingos. I mean, that's the kind of stuff. So were you having someone blow glass to be the exact? Well, I, had, I wound up having five of these brothers from Columbia work for me. I, I wound up having a studio in Brooklyn, which was actually on First Street and Third Avenue. And across the street was Con Edison, but across the street used to be the old Ebbets Field. Wow. The first Ebbets Field where the Dodgers would play. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather had a bar there. And I didn't know any of this. And it wound up, I, I just liked the space when I was there. My parents lived up the block. So I, I got the space on Third Avenue and First Street, and then my mother said, that's where Grandpa had the bar. I said, you're kidding. So that was my grandfather's boss. So I would, I would work in Brooklyn. Michael ran the studio. In the morning, I would drive from Queens to Brooklyn and then go to Manhattan in the afternoon and pick him up and then return home to Queens, you know? So it was kind of, I was in all the boroughs every day. I spent most of the day on the highway. I had to get up, I had to get up earlier and earlier every day. I would get in for eight o'clock because the, uh, the glass blowers would get there very early in the day, you know, and we had a lot sleep? of Well, I had a fine time to sleep, but I loved, I loved, I don't know what it was, but I really got into the neon. I knew nothing about it. Every time when we started out the business, we had to go to a sign shop. Okay. And, and most of the sign shops that I found had neon equipment in the back. It was sort of like a Frankenstein laboratory. Do you know the Oh, the Jacob's Ladder thing where right. it goes up. Right. Well, when you put on the, uh, when you heat up the neon, it, it is like a Frankenstein laboratory. It makes, does it and make then, a sound? Huh? Does it make a sound? Oh yeah, it does. And then one of the funny things, because I now have in the gallery at my home, an original Tesla machine. Right, you refurbished it. Yes, what happened was when we first opened the Green Emporium in Colerain, there was a tag sale going on behind a gallery. Some people had, the owner had passed away. He was an electrician. His name was Herzig. He had passed, his wife had passed, and they were selling out everything in the house. So Michael, of course, wanted to go and see what they had in the kitchen. I went into the garage, and I saw this collapsed kind of machine. There, there'll be a picture yeah, of I'll it. Pull, you you know, I'll pull it up. When, yeah, yeah, well, you, you have to about. show this. Because I, I said, Mr., what are you going to do with that? He said, uh, well, if nobody buys it, 
we're going to throw it in the dumpster outside. I so said, you really? waited until. So I said, <laughs> yeah, I said, so I said, please, do you think I could have it? So we tied it all up. It was collapsed. It was really falling apart. Right. And uh, I brought it to the, the restaurant, and I put it in the hallway of the Green Emporium. And then when, when it was there for about three months, a car, a truck pulls up. This man, he looks like Daniel Boone. He had a, one of those. A coonskin yeah, cap. Could, yeah, he had a cap. He comes in with his wife. He, on his truck outside, it had saved the whales. You know, he was really into uh, the natural. So he says to me, do you know what you have there? I said, no. I was thinking of maybe adding neon. You just it was, thought it was interesting. It was very interesting. But the man had told me, I forgot to tell you this part, because I used to say to him, what is that? He said, I think it's called a Tesla machine. And I said, yeah. He said, all I know is that when my uncle, he said, used to turn it on, all the telephones in Colerain would go out of whack. Oh, <laughs> they, you're the reason why. <laughs> the phones wouldn't work. <laughs> so I didn't know what was going on. So I brought it down. You know, I had it tied up. This guy says to me, I could fix that. So I said, all right, so fix it. So he says, I'll take it and fix it. Five years later, I said to Michael one day, you know, I what wonder- What happened to him? I wonder, I wonder if that guy ever fixed that machine. And he said, oh, I called him up. I had the phone number, I called him up. I said, did you ever fix that machine? He said, yes, I did. I said, how long did you work on it? <laughs> he said, 500 hours. No way. I said, how much do you want an, an hour? He said, how about a dollar? I said, I think I can handle that. Well, anyway, I have to tell you this. When I walked into the Green Emporium that day, we had, we had a lobby and then we had opened another door to go in the restaurant. They had brought it into the restaurant. I went, I nearly cried. I couldn't believe how beautiful it looked. It was completely restored. And did and, it still mess up the phones in Colerain? Well, I, I, <laughs> we used to play it, but the only thing is that you, if you have a pacemaker. Oh. I, have to, I, used to, I used to do demos, and we would do it in the Colerain Fair. We would have it at the Historic Society. I would take light bulbs. You would put your finger up to it. It sends out an arc that smells like ozone. Right. And, it, and there was a ball on the top. The Tesla that coil. It would, it would, the coil was, you, you could see the coil. Right. It was like the Jacob's Ladder. You would see the thing running up, and then this arc would come out, and it would go to this ball. But if you touched it, it would go through your body. Right, you would conduct it. And you could hold a light bulb and I would hold a neon tube. And then the man who fixed it, he came in with a doctor's kit. And it actually had a prostate, you know, examining, and it was made out of neon. And I said, what happens if it ever breaks? They said, well, you got a free, you know, examination. <laughs> <laughs> oh my but God. anyway, it was a hit. He had all these different things. Not he the like, examinations. No, no. He loved, he loved neon. And I wound up giving him some of my sparkle tubes, and we had a great relationship. But anyway, I've given it to my, uh, uh, my best friend's son. He's, he's, he's one of the kids that really loves it. So he, he has it now, but he's thinking of bringing it out to the Tesla. They're building a museum. In Buffalo? Or? No, in Montauk. Tesla had this idea that he had wanted to build the Wyckoff Tower. Mm -hmm. It was a huge ball on the top. Mm -hmm. And when it was activated, it would send out electric that when all the ships were coming by the sound, the Long Island Sound and coming into the harbor, their light bulbs would light up without having to put on any power. Oh. He was a man before his time. He worked with Edison. And yes, well, Edison's it's a quite, and yeah, everybody's Everybody laughs up this man's life, but they all, he, he wound up with nothing, you right. know I mean? But he's a genius. We have a card named after him today. Sure. People are finally realizing who he was, right. you know? But I was so happy to have it. But I think what he's planning on doing is bringing it out to them, and I think it'll be a treat for them to see it. But it'll also be a treat for people to go to your gallery. So you're located in Colerain in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I, I live What are your on, hours? Well, I'm open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And I'm opening up from 10 o'clock until about 5 o'clock. And I'm selling my artworks, and I'm selling my neons. I just put another neon installation in the garden. I finished it yesterday. 
So if someone wants to get in touch or to see it, do they go to greenemporium.com? Well, or? They, can go, they can contact me right now on Facebook. We are making a website for it. Okay. It'll be called the Barrel Shop Gallery. Okay. Uh, but they can contact me at greenemporium.com, which is my email address. And uh, they're welcome to come any Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. We are open. And uh, they can see my artworks, and they can see my neon artwork. So it, is it kind of an open house? They just walk around because I remember oh, and you, the gardens too. Because and, the gardens, and you had sculptures and stuff out in the gardens. They have my sculptures in the garden. I have my garden sculptures too. And you, I and remember when I used to work. By the way, uh, the viewers may not know this, but I used to work for you and, and Michael at the <laughs> I, green I, at, I the, know. at the pizzeria. <laughs> um, I know, the and pizzeria. I much preferred. I miss the pizzeria. I, I, it was a lot of fun. We did a lot of crazy things. Yeah, and I, as I, the evening went on, they got crazier and crazier. <laughs> um, we met a lot of wonderful people. I can't tell you. But Everybody this. knows us. I mean, some, one time we had to go to Shelma Falls. There used to be a place called down in the, you know where the fudge factory the is? The Tuscan now? Rattle, you mean, or the Down Under? or the No, yeah, the down, yeah. There was, no, there was a, a restaurant. Right. And uh, when, when we used to walk in there, we used to cover our face. We didn't want people to know we were going in for a hamburger, you know. Oh, uh, right. Uh, yeah, but, but anyway, uh, you we had, was a lot of fun. I miss the Green Emporium. So when I, about the time that I stopped working there, in fact, I had I'd been a, the, uh, the host for a while. Yeah. And then later, you asked me if I would play music. Yeah. And so my jazz and band And a lot played. of people played. Did yeah. I ever tell you the story when Arnie Black came? You know, he used yeah, to Yeah, well, I knew him. I, I actually went to his house in Brooklyn. He, was he yeah. in Brooklyn? Well, he was in New York. He was I in New know, York, but, maybe but in the West he, East He's side. passed on now. Right. But he used to do these concerts at the, the Federated Mohawk, right. Church. Right. So I didn't know. There's a woman named Jan Morris in Balcom, her okay. husband. And I didn't know who they were. Right. So it was, it was a surprise to me. Arnie comes in with lunch, to lunch, and he's bringing Jan and, and Balcom to the restaurant. We had just bought a piano at the restaurant. So this woman's there. She looks moderately dressed. She's got on dungarees, you know, sunglasses. And I said, Arnie, I, Arnie was there with Ruth, and I said, Arnie, we just got a piano. Do you think you would uh, it? check it out yeah, for right. me, you know? So instead of him getting up, Balcom gets up. And then the woman gets up. I didn't know who she was, Jan. And she starts singing, bye bye, Blackbird, you know. And uh, I said, lady, you have a great voice. <laughs> I said, would you ever think of coming and singing at the Green Emporium? She says to me, what are you doing tonight? I said, uh, I don't know, we'll probably go to the Heath Fair. <laughs> okay. She says, why don't you come to the Federated Church in Shalma? So we go to the Federated Church, and all of a sudden, this woman is transformed. What a beautiful black dress. She looks gorgeous. I said, Michael, they, the place was sold out. They had no room. We were hanging around, but they put chairs in the vestibule over there. So I says, she must have something to do with the show, you know? Well, he comes out. He goes over to the piano. Then she comes out. I said, guess what, Michael? She is the show. Right. And, and we became very good friends that way. And she used to bring me uh, her latest album every time she would come up, once a year. You had some fascinating friends. You were friends with Blossom Deary. Oh, yeah. Michael knew Blossom very well. And, and Alice Parker sang. Yeah, and we're good friends with Karen Allison. I don't know if you know her. She's a I wonderful don't. jazz singer. She's a good friend. She's been to our house also. She, she lives in. Uh, well, she lives up here in Waitley, and she has a home, but she also lives in New York. So how did you go from the disco era to being jazz lovers? Well, Michael is a jazz aficionado. He's a music. So that was, jazz, that was Michael more than you then? Well, Michael was in, yeah, Michael, when I first heard Blossom Dairy, you know, Mike used to like to go out to the bar or whatever, and he'd come home at 4 o'clock in the morning and start playing Blossom Dairy. And I said, if you play another one of those records, I'll fling him out the window. I didn't understand that voice. You know, she right. has a very, very unique, peculiar. A very unique voice. Mm -hmm. But she grew on me. And right. one time we went to the village in the winter. It was in a snowstorm. And we go into this bar where she's playing. We were the only audience. She looks around and she says, I have an audience. I'm going to play. <laughs> so she played for us too. But Michael used to buy all her albums all the time. And she's a very big oh, person yeah. today, even though she's gone. You know, and you used to see her sitting in all the shows. She was a little short lady, very small, very timid. 
and she'd just be there very quietly. But everybody knows it today, you know. Right. So we're very good friends. I love the jazz station too. But well, it's just so part of what was interesting to me about the church, the Green Emporium, the pizzeria, is that in the middle of coal rain, it's yeah. like it's in the middle of nowhere in a way. I know. There's almost like a New York City salon <laughs> going on. In fact, you had people drive up from New York City to yeah. have dinner. Well, at we were on the road that they all would go up to, to go skiing. Uh, yeah, skiing the mouse. No, and yeah. they knew. In fact, Tom Rainey, who does the yeah. jazz show, a jazz, he was jazz at our house mode. last week. Really? He, yeah, he calls us up. Let's go have lunch. Or, so he and his wife came over later, and I mean, he, he really knows what's going on. He knows all the latest jazz people. But we do love music. I, I mean. Oh, but so I was, what I was getting back to, so about the time that I left the Green Emporium or the pizzeria, you had a new project. It was neon, but it was on pallets, and they were kind of stacked in a pyramid. Oh, yeah. So what I, happened with that? Well, they destroyed it on me. They? Was well, some vandals? I, I don't want to talk okay, about so it. You, but anyway, right. I did put it, I called it the Pyramid of Hope. Right. This was in 2012 when the world was supposed to end. We had no, we have nothing in Colorado. Right. So I had gotten permission from the people at the other church building, you know, because I wanted to put it on my lawn, but our building inspector said I didn't have enough room. Mm -hmm. So I asked these other people and I built this pyramid. I called it the Pyramid of Hope. And I illuminated, it was beautiful. but. Let, let's not the, go there. Okay, well, I'm sorry to bring it up. I just remember no, I thought that was No, it hurts. I mean, I also did the flag. I wanted to put neon on the Bridge of Flowers. I think I was a little ahead of my time. And then I think it was Mary Cohen from right, Bobby Cohen's mother comes to me. And she says, uh, they wouldn't let me do it there. She says to me, I was to Paris. And she sends me a photograph. And they did it across the street from Notre Dame. And we could have had it sooner than right, them, right. you know. And mine would have been red and blue. It would have been beautiful. Well, unfortunately, though, we've, can you believe we've already run out of time? We have. We've already run out of time. Well, I'll have to come back in another. <laughs> You'll have to come back. I mean, I think it was probably seven or eight years ago you were on. I don't remember. We, I, yeah. You were telling me about some stinky sandwich made out of sardines that you had on the subway. Oh no, that's when I or was anchovies. a kid. Yeah. I, I, when I was a kid, I drove every day on the subway. My mother would make me homemade sandwiches. She would make these wonderful preserves, but they had a smell because they had anchovy in it. Mm. So I would put my sandwich down <laughs> on the floor, and when people went like this, I, I looked around too, and then I would pick it up and go, and go to work. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much. Thank I love you, you so much. Thank it's so you. good to see you. Thank you. I'm Drew Hutchison. You've been tuned to Local Bias. My guest has been Tony Pacifico Palumbo. Uh, yeah, that's right. And you can watch our, uh, this episode at your convenience at gctv.org. So do that and go to the gallery. Yeah. I will take care.